I would like to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8. We are going to read the first two verses of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. And the Word of God says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Let's pray. Let's ask God to bless our lives in this morning through this word. Thank you, Father. Thank you, our dear God, our precious Lord. Thank you for your mercy and your goodness. Thank you for this opportunity, Father, to listen to your voice. Your words, Lord, are eternal life to us. We need more of you. We need more of your presence, more of your power. We need you, Father, through your Holy Spirit, giving us comfort, peace, joy, understanding of your word. Help us, Lord, not only to listen to it, but to do it, to live it on a daily basis. In the mighty name of our beloved Jesus Christ, we ask you this, Lord. I place my, hand, my life in your hands. I place myself, Lord, in your holy will so that you may do whatever you want to do. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray, Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. The title for the message of today is The Way to the Promise. The Way to the Promise. In this passage, God was speaking to his chosen people. We know that Israel is the chosen people of our God. Israel had received from God the promise to be blessed. The Lord told them, you will be blessed, you will be a great nation. And that promise was given to Israel through Abraham. In Genesis 12, from verse 1 to 3, the word of God says, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, and to a land that I will shew thee. So he was giving them kind of instruction. Firstly to Abram. And God told him, go out. Go out from your place. Go out from your house. Go out from your fathers. And I will show you a land. Right? And in verse 2 it says, and here the promise came. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless you and curse him that curses you, and in you shall all families of the earth be blessed. That was the promise given to Abraham, and that's why we are part of this promise because through Abraham, this promise of blessing all the nations includes us. Amen. We know, of course, that many times we have heard that in order to receive a promise, there are some conditions. And many, in many occasions, that's true. It, it, it's true. It happens. But... When we try to see, to analyze, to examine in a deeper way that fact of complying with some conditions, of depending on our works, we have to acknowledge that we will never obey God enough to receive his blessings. Even to the people of Israel it happened. The Lord from the beginning was telling them, obey 
hear my voice, follow my commandments, keep my commandments. But they hardly ever could do it. Because usually the Lord was scolding them. The Lord was telling them, you are stiff-necked people. You are stubborn. And the people knew. The people knew that those conditions that the Lord had uh, placed in order for them to receive the promise. But they failed many times. However, the people of Israel were able to enter into that land. Were able to enter into the promise. Yes, you can say, well, but they were not the same people. Yes, they were not the same people. But they were part of the people of Israel. So, something that I would like to clarify firstly is that many times we are unfaithful, but God remains faithful to his promise. And although the Lord has been telling us, do this, do that, so that you be blessed, so that you may receive the promise, despite our failures, despite our sinful condition, the Lord remains faithful to his word, to what he just said. So in Exodus 32, 9, we find that God was telling the people of Israel, stiff-necked people. He was telling them, you are stubborn. And to be stiff-necked is a reference to oxen. The oxen, when they uh, refuse to bend their necks, right, and allowed a joke to be placed upon them. So when, when that animal was rebellious and didn't want to bend his neck to be joked, then they said, this is a stiff-necked animal. And sometimes we have to acknowledge that we are like that. The Lord has been telling us through his word what we should do to be blessed, and we behave also like stiff naked people. But despite our stubbornness, God us uh, usually expects us to demonstrate the love we say that we have towards him. Because when we are part of his people, we usually come to a service, we love singing, we love worshiping him, praising him, and we should do it, of course. And while we sing and while we praise him, we tell him, God, you are the most important person to me. God, I love you with everything I have. But the Lord also said, the Lord Jesus in his word, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Which means that when we keep the commandments of the Lord, when we obey him, we are telling the Lord, Lord, I love you. Lord, indeed, I love you. It has to be something more than words. It has to be a word that is put into action, that is being demonstrated by the things we do. So the Lord knows our sinful nature. The Lord knows that we want to obey him, but he knows that we want to love him, but he also knows that many times we fail. And that is the wonderful grace of God. That despite what we are, despite what we do, he's still there awaiting us. He's still there ready to help us. And that is the way that we are following, that we are walking therein. A way to conquer a final promise. Because like the people of Israel was able to enter into that promised land despite their unfaithfulness, you and I also expect to arrive to that wonderful promise, to the promised land in heaven, to meet our God despite many times we are unfaithful. So the way to the promise, my dear brother and easy and, and, um, and brother and sister, is not easy. It's not easy. Despite we have many blessings and many promises, it's not easy because of our carnal 
nature. So, the Church of Christ, like the people of Israel, has always faced different trials, different kinds of tribulation. But the Lord said that he will forsake us from all those things, that he will deliver us from all those things. And indeed, he has done it. And he will continue doing that. He will continue delivering us. We have different kinds of ways in this life. We have ways that are wide, others that are narrow, some are soft, smooth, some others are very hard to walk, some probably are flat and others are very steep, that we have to struggle a lot to be able to reach the summit. But the Bible says that concerning that heavenly city that is waiting for us, concerning that spiritual promised land that is awaiting us, there is only one way. And that only one way is our Lord Jesus Christ. In Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 15, the Bible says that that wilderness that the people of Israel had to be there and walk there was great and terrible. That wilderness was great and terrible. It had fiery serpents, it had scorpions, and drought, which means no water. And that was the place, not that the devil led the people to that place. It was not the enemy who led the people to that wilderness. It was God himself. God himself led them to that fiery place full of scorpions and drought. And in our lives, probably sometimes we feel like that. We feel like walking through a desert. We feel like no water is around, that we are thirsty, that we're about to die, that the scorpions are too heavy, too wild, too dangerous. But the Lord is there. And you can say, oh, it's the enemy who is attacking me. Well, probably, yes, the enemy is around you. But it is the perfect will of God to be in that wilderness. It was God who has led you and led me to that place. To abandon us there, no. To destroy us, no. It's because it is necessary, because that is the way that he has set for us to reach the promise. Praise the Lord. So Jesus in John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. That is our way. Jesus Christ is our way. He is our life. He is our truth. And that's why we should smell, eat, drink from Jesus. To be full of Jesus. Because he is the one guiding us through those difficult hardships and circumstances we have to face. He is the way to reach to the Father. He is the way to reach to eternal life. He is the way to reach to heaven. There is not another way. There is not another person. There is not another God. There is not another Savior. Only one who is Jesus. And although Jesus is the way, it doesn't mean that everything will be smooth and easy. Because our very same Lord Jesus, in his way to the cross, he had to suffer. He had to take up the cross and go to Golgotha. And it implied for him effort. He implied suffering. Yes, he had to suffer to face very difficult things that nobody in the world could ever face again. 
Nobody can do the same thing that the Lord Jesus Christ did. He was, he is, and he will be the only one able to do such a tremendous sacrifice. But it is not easy. It is not easy. And yes, we have Jesus, and yes, we have the Holy Spirit, but it is not easy. Like Brother Sammy was telling us during these days, there is a, like a symbolic price that we have to pay. Because even if we think that we suffer a lot here on earth, we will never suffer as much as the Lord Jesus Christ did. He paid it all. He made the greatest thing. But those little things that we have to face are temporary and are not as hard as the Lord Jesus had to face. So Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says that the broad, that the way is broad. The way is broad. Which way? The one that leads to destruction. The one that many people choose because many people want to take the easiest, the, the, the wide way. And it leads to destruction. But the one that is narrow is a difficult way. And that way is the one that leads to life. And few are the ones who find that way. Few, my brother. How many millions of people we are in the world? We are millions. And out of those millions, you and I are part of that wonderful blessing to be children of God. And we wish, that's why we go out to preach, because we, our greatest desire is that more people may know what you and I know, that may enjoy what you and I enjoy. But somehow they haven't been able to see the revelation, to receive the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, the Lord Jesus, when he was in his way to give us redemption, to pay for our sins, to forgive us, all what he took was the cross. The Lord Jesus had a family. When he was here on earth, he has a mother, he has a father, he has some siblings, he had friends, he, have, he had followers, he had many things. Although the Bible says that he didn't have a place where to lay down his head, but in fact, he had some things or some people around him. But when it was the moment to take up the cross, only he and the cross, was, he was going up, up, up to that mountain to Golgotha, to the mount of the school, which means death. The cross has been a representation of death. And when in, in John 19, 17, the Bible says that he, referring to the Lord Jesus, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a school, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. And there, people crucified him and two others with him. So we shouldn't lose our focus, my brother. We should always keep our eyes on what is really important for our eternal lives. The Lord Jesus, he was suffering. He was bearing so many hardships. People were mocking him. People were hitting him, but his focus was on the plan of redemption. His focus was to finish his task, to accomplish what God had told him to do. And that's why we need also, like Jesus did, to deny ourselves. The Bible says that he didn't cleave, he didn't hold fast to his throne but he was able to put his throne, to put his glory, to put all those godly things aside, to become a man, to humble himself and take the shape of a man. 
He humbled himself. He was not a stiff-necked person, but he bent his neck. And sometimes we forget that. And we are not able to bend our necks. And we still want to follow this way with that shape of our body like a representation of our pride. And we forget that the Lord Jesus humbled himself being God because he wanted to follow that path to the promised land, to the plan of redemption because he understood the focus and he didn't take care of himself. He didn't worry too much about himself, about his position. All what he wanted was to glorify God and God glorified him because he was obedient and obedient to death. So I find a connection between death, obedience, and love. Indeed, when we want to demonstrate our love to God, we need to obey. And to obey many times, we need to die. We need to die to our fleshly desires. We need to die to our own pride. We need to die to many sinful things that probably we feel attracted to, but that they will disqualify us to go to the kingdom of heaven. You and I need to take up our cross. And that cross means that we are dead to sin. That we are dead to all those uh, things that are calling us from the world. The passion, the desires, the lust. All those things need to die we need to sacrifice that on the cross. We need to be crucified with Jesus. Our passions, our desires, all that is sinful, all that causes us to be separated from our God. But you know what also the cross means? The cross also means uh, or reminds us the great sacrifice, the greatest sign of love from our Lord Jesus. And it reminds us also his grace. And his grace, the Bible says, that is sufficient. It is sufficient. We have the grace of God. We have the Holy Spirit. And that's why we can take up our cross and follow that path, that way. It's that we are not alone. We haven't been abandoned by God. Yes, things can be hectic, can be hard, can be difficult, but God has given us the promise of the Holy Spirit, and if the Holy Spirit is with us, he will help us, my brother. So it is possible to please God. It is possible to live separated from sin. It is possible to be dead to sin, but we need to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and follow Jesus, follow his footprints. And, and the Lord promised us to be with us, not because we deserve it, but because he knows that we need him and because he loves us. So my brother and sister, the spirit of God is always there to help us in our weaknesses, in our infirmities. We don't know many times how to pray when we are in hardships. But the Lord says that the Spirit will help us and will intercede for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. He searches the hearts. He knows what the mind of the Spirit is. And he makes intercession for all the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to the ones who have been called according to his purpose. So we shouldn't fear. We shouldn't fear. Because even if we die in our way to the promised land, if we die, that is gain. 
If we die, we will be with the Lord forever. If we die, no more mourning here, no more crying, no more trials, no more tribulations. So what is waiting for us is greater, greater than anything else that you can desire here on earth. God, God led to the people of Israel to the desert. And God is leading us through this life even in those difficult moments. He is there. He decided something specific for each one of us. Not only the nice and positive things, but also the hard things were created and placed in our way by God. But he promised us not to be alone. I don't know if I have a couple of minutes to read just a portion. Sorry? What time is it, please? Okay, thank you. So let's go to First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. Oh, sorry, First Peter chapter 1. Praise the Lord. Verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth, fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept, you and I are kept by the power of God through faith and to salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though, though now, for a season, it means for a moment, something temporary, if need be, you are in heaviness through many fall temptations. Why those temptations, those trials are necessary? Verse 7, that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Who having not seen ye love, in whom thou now ye see him not, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the end of your confidence, the end of your trust in God is the salvation of your souls. Praise the Lord. The Lord has promised to be with us, to guide us, to keep us with his power, not because we deserve it. So my dear brother and sister, we need to keep on fighting the good fight of faith. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, I was studying and I read a title. I don't usually have subtitles in, in my personal Bible, but I was reading another one. And there is a subtitle in 1 Corinthians 15, 50, which says, our final victory our final victory. And it says that it, it is an invitation that the apostle is writing. And it says, what I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But that these dying bodies, yes, cannot inherit what will last forever. In these physical bodies, we will not inherit what will be eternal. But the apostle says in verse 51, let me reveal a secret. Let me reveal a secret. We will not all die, but we will be all changed, transformed. All of us, the one who died in Christ or the one who will be found live when Jesus comes, all of us will be transformed. And it will happen in a moment, in the blinking of an eye, when the last trumpet shall sound, 
And when that happens, my brother and sisters, those who are died will be raised, will be resurrected. And if we are alive, we will flee to the heavens to be with God. And those, these mortal bodies will be transformed, will be changed into immortal bodies. And can you imagine that glorious day, my brother? So in verse 55, it says, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death. So no more sin, no more death. They are destroyed. They have been conquered. They have been put aside by the sacrifice of, the, uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why, my dear brother and sister, we need to be strong. In verse 58, the apostles, verse 57, let's read. It says, but thank God, but thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work fervently, enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is in vain. Nothing we do for the Lord is in vain. If we cry here, if we work hard, no matter how difficult it is, nothing will be in vain for our Lord. Amen. So we need to hold fast to those promises. We need to persevere serving God. We need to be faithful to him because he has promised to be with us and nothing we do will be in vain. If you have to cry to be holy for the Lord, that will not be in vain. If you have to cry because you have a very difficult husband, nothing will be in vain. If you are crying because you haven't been married, Nothing will be in vain, my brother and sister. Nothing will be in vain. Let's pray.